Um, so I'm Chris Aftemieu, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Health Insurance Geeks. And um, you know, it's a, it's an interesting time. Um, and I've been doing this since I got out of college, and have touched. Uh, when I say this, by the way, let me just give you uh, 20 seconds. Um, I've been on the provider side. I've been a financial underwriter in the fastest growing HMO in the United States, happen to be here. I've built bank-owned insurance brokerages. I've advised other companies. And I've been uh, an employee benefits consultant, funding consultant, on and off for like the last 20, 25 years while doing, doing those other things. Um, so I come at this, I think, from a very, very different angle than most of the folks that uh, will challenge our ideas or um, might uh, blow holes in our ideas. And the re result is uh, I'm not here to um, offend anybody. Um, I'm just here to give some stats and some truth about what's going on from my perspective. And uh, you can take it uh, and with it whatever you so choose. Um, but I, uh, I've done so much of this over the years that um, you know, I think my skin has gotten very, very, very thick. Um, and I mean, this is a pretty good, uh, pretty good question. And we're actually, the reason why I use this, this uh, deck um, is we're going to start pushing out some videos um, that are just going to sort of challenge the status quo a little bit. Um, nobody answers that question, by the way, that they jump up and down about their, their health insurance or health care. We're not talking about, do you love your doctor? We're talking about, do you like the person or place that pays for all this stuff? And um, it's very, 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 very rare that I hear folks jump up and down and say, I love who pays my claims. Um, and the unfortunate thing is, if I go back through my career um, after um, the provider side, which was in Washington, D.C., um, it was Oxford Health Plans. And anybody that's from here or around here will remember the meteoric rise of Oxford Health Plans in the very early to mid-1990s. We're the fastest growing company in the United States. And we sort of ripped the guts out of the insurance marketplace, to put it bluntly, during that time period as far as the folks that we were taking business from. And um, it reminds me very much of what is going on today and why we had that opportunity 25 years ago. And uh, it's sort of the same old, you know, uh, the one, and for I saw some hands go up. Uh, I think there might be some hospital folks here. But, you know, these irresponsible markups, um, some folks might know what charge master means. Some folks might not. The folks that are shaking their head up and down, um, that's you know the internal mafia in the hospital system that is buried in some bunker that nobody can find that runs the racket. And I hate to put it that way, but now that there's data transparency, like I'm not sort of talking out of school. Um, so when you start seeing pricing that is, uh, and when I do these talks, um, I usually ratchet it back. 200, 400, 500, 900 percent of X. I call that irresponsible, no matter who's counting the beans. Um, and then like the embarrassing ben benefits part, let me just make sure I'm doing this right. Is that my guy? Yeah, can you see that? Um, it, embarrassing benefits. Um, the unfortunate thing here is over this time frame, the benefits are, they're embarrassing now. If you just look at what has happened to co-pays, what has happened to co-insurance, but guess what that's moving in tandem with? This irresponsible, or, uh, irresponsible markups and how premium has moved, right? So everything's like in tandem. It's just unfortunate. And uh, whether you're a proponent of single-payer health care or, just want to look how I'm doing on time, um, single-payer health care or you hate single-payer health care, the reality is, now, as we move along, um, and by the way, we're all in, sort of imprisoned in this system right now, is, is the gist of our, our, our video. And uh, this is our company. I'm not here to talk about health insurance geeks, but just sort of like ideas, and we're running against the clock. Um, you know, what's the opportunity to fix this? Well, when I was a kid, we didn't have this thing called Obamacare or the ACA. Um, whether you hate it or you love it, it's not my uh, job to sit here and debate against it or say I love it or I hate it. Um, I will say neg a negative comment and a positive comment. Um, the positive comment is at least it's something that threw a wedge into the system. So from my perspective, and if I look back over the years from uh, you know, financial underwriting with, with insurance, um, it's good that there was this sort of political governmental wedge that was thrown into the system because it just jacked up a lot of players, some of which might be in this room. For example, just data, transparency, connectivity, so like electronic medical records. 
So a lot of things that I've been talking about for like the last 25 years, and you sort of scratch your head every year, and you're like, this year it's not going to happen. This year it's not going to happen. Now at least stuff is happening. The unfortunate thing is, from day one of the ACA, we knew that it was dead before it started, just from the standpoint of how it was funded and what had to happen for it to work. And um, anybody that has understood or heard the 550 principle, um, you know, 5% of the people in our geography are gonna drive over 50% of the claims, and you can take that out. 10% are gonna approach 70% of the claims. About 20% are driving 100%. And of course, that 20% changes every year. Um, so the unfortunate thing is we build a system sort of just looking at the 5 percenters at the expense of the 95 percenters that are all miserable. Um, the 5% can never be happy. And at any given time during a year, one of us might be a five percenter. I giggle in our company, we practice what we preach. Um, now I was the five percenter this year because I blew my shoulder out doing stuff I shouldn't have been doing and had a surgery and I turned into sort of like the big claimant. And that happens when you're in your mid forties and still trying to do things you were doing when you were uh, 25. Um, and so at any rate, um, you know, running against this clock, um, make sure you can see, you know, this clock my God, this thing has been just going on forever, right, since I started doing this. Um, and the clock to me is the cliff. We're going off a cliff. Um, I don't think anybody in this room would say you feel like your health insurance is affordable, right? And if you go and have a service in a hospital and you get a bill, number one, you either understand it. Number two, you can find somebody to understand it for you. And number three, you feel like it's fair. And... Um, and then number four, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, in Matt's uh, opening remarks about um, a slow-moving industry, I mean, talk about slow. Um, at Oxford Health Plans, we were talking about this stuff when I was a kid, and our founder and CEO, Steve Wiggins, he was just, and he still is today, he was a revolutionary, and he was a visionary, and just a genius. And the stuff he was saying we had to do when I was a kid, it's like the same stuff. Nobody was reinventing anything. And I'm an advisor in a couple companies, you know, one, they're doing HSAs, and I giggle with those kids, and I'm like, you know, this isn't new stuff. We've been talking about this for a long time. The problem is nobody's capitulated. And I feel like now we're finally maybe seeing slow capitulation, where people are, they're starting to throw their hands up. So lastly, um, when I'm talking about, um, and does anybody, like reference-based pricing, and not entirely just here to say, hey, reference-based pricing, but flipping how payments happen on its ear. Does everybody somewhat know what I'm talking about with the reference-based pricing mechanism? Okay, so um, most, I'm just gonna assume not, but um, you know, today, insurance carriers pay based on how providers bill, right? So there is no real reference to it other than when we buy Oxford or United Healthcare or Cigna or Aetna or whomever it may be, we get a discount because of their quote-unquote buying power, right? Um, that average, when we run our models, 29 to maybe 40% these days, um, that's not the way it was, again, when I was a kid. It's eroded a little bit. So whatever's billed, because you're that consumer, you get that discount from your carrier. Well, guess what? Is it good for you if the starting point is 850X? No, you're still paying many hundred uh, percent higher than you should. So a reference-based system, and usually um, there will be sort of like two forks to how it's done. One is some kind of a multiple on the Medicare system, because ironically enough, 50% of hospitals in the United States are profitable just on their Medicare reimbursement schedules. And 60% of hospital um, claims that run through hospitals actually run through the Medicare payment system. Now, I'm not here to suggest that it's all got to be Medicare, which would sort of be like the single payer philosophy per se, but at least like it's a starting point of something that has a reservoir of data to say, okay, well, now we're going to work off of that. So I don't care what you're billing me. We're going to work off of a reference and then go up from there. We're not gonna go down from these ridiculous bills. Um, and I've got a, a couple of minutes here and I'm gonna give, give a couple of um, uh, statistics that I, f I find uh, alarming or just like price spreads. And I've lived through it, so I've lived through it you know, as, a, as a payer, um, excuse me, as a, um, as a patient. Um, I've seen them as, as, as payer. Um, I've seen it on the provider side. But if we do research when we're actually consuming care, we can avoid pitfalls and we can actually win, but we can't just assume what we're buying is gonna save us money or do the right thing anymore. And I'm just gonna end with a story about my, my shoulder and good consumer versus bad consumer. 
And uh, if I had been maybe anybody else that did what I did to my shoulder and had to have the surgery I had to have done, I probably would have just called a friend who did the same thing, and I knew he did because I play sports with him. And he'll say, hey, go to you know, doctor such and such, and he's awesome, and his place is awesome, and he'll take care of you, and it'll be great. You'll be back playing tennis and golf and all the stuff you do. And I still did that. But then you know, I put on sort of my surgical mitts and started ripping apart what they were planning on doing. And I may have ended up in an outpatient surgery center owned by the large hospital system where I live, which is not in Metro New York City. And I'll, I'll not name anything to protect the innocent. Um, and uh, let's just say it's very similar to some of the hospital systems here. And um, if I had gone to this, that surgeon who I definitely wanted to have, the anesthesiologist, gone in and out in a couple of hours, pre, post-op, all of it, the actual cost, because we're in a reference-based pricing system where we are and we're self-funded, so we see all this stuff. Um, it would have been about a $30,000 event, which people might shrug their shoulders. No, not for what I was having done, rotator cuff, shave off some bone spurs. Egregious, that's my gut. So uh, what are the alternatives? You guys probably have your own surgical center. Yeah, they do. Okay, well, I'm gonna go to that because I know that's gonna be you know, a quarter, a fifth, a tenth of X as far as the cost. So I did that with every single part, and I had it done same day, it was two hours, great result, I'm already back, and it was three months and I was back to full activity, and my cost was 7,500 bucks. And the funny thing about all of it is, surgeon got plenty, he wasn't crying. They actually run a very tight, well-oiled machine in their outpatient surgery center, way less overhead than in the hospital. The one that I actually wanted to go and maybe put on my wrestling singlet and get him on the ground and, and uh, wrestle him up a little bit was actually the anesthesiologist. He was more than any of them. And uh, d from my perspective, as far as like time, um, was the most egregious of all of them. For the amount of time and what he did and what the bill was, he was completely out of whack. But it's still a win because we were down, you know, whatever that is, 30% of X or less. Um, so that's like a story about um, how it can work, and I've got a couple seconds here and I'll shut up. Um, you know, my dad, I was born in Greece, my dad's Greek, he was just over there and he came back, and of course the, we all know Greece has their own, their own problems um, economically, but single payer, you know, universal, socialized model. And he went and saw a friend who had his, his hip done, who was in the hospital for 10 or 12 days for hip replacement. I mean, they basically put you on a mini trampoline in like minutes in this country. Uh, no nurse, you have to hire and bring your own. No bed sheets, you have to bring your own. No soap, bring your own. I mean, you basically go in a metal room and have to bring all your stuff. And I would suggest that, um, you know, we don't want to go there, but we're over here. We do, number one, we do not have the best health care on the planet. That's documented. Not even close. Not even in the top ten. So it's embarrassing now. And a lot of people laugh at us. So we're not the best. You know what we are? We're the most expensive. And we have the folks that make the most money. And that's, to me, that's just in my closing comments, it's, it's getting a little offensive that um, you know, folks actually still believe that we do. We don't. If you compare us to certain countries, maybe. But um, take that as the, the leading point here as I jump off. But um, hopefully I inspired some thought and um, just tried to keep it real based on my experience. And uh, thanks for having me today. Thank you, Chris. That, and, uh, it's, and it's exactly what I heard from him when we first talked, that here's another pissed off ex-wrestler uh, trying to fix things, wants to put a singlet on. I, I don't really want to wear a singlet anymore, and honestly, you don't want me to either. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, so, so that, that's the, my, my hope were, was that we would identify and start talk, keep talking about the real problems that still exist that are not fixed yet. Um, uh, we're working on it. We're making progress. A lot of really great companies have come into the space, including health insurance geeks and, and a bunch of other uh, amazing companies.